Recording on this computer. Okay, we're recording. So if you want to send me something from a chat GPT, you can right click on your mouse if you put it over the uh, on the left where it lists the the conversations, the different chats, and you can share a chat with somebody. Also, I just copy the text and paste it into a Google Docs or paste it into an email. There are lots of ways to uh, to send it. In terms of right here in class, we can share screens and we can open up the screen and look at look at your screen and see it there. So there are lots of different ways that we can uh, we can do things. Uh, probably something that I don't know about. And it varies a bit depending on the, the kind of computer you're using. Actually, I have some things like that on the uh, on the uh, PowerPoint or the slides for today. So why don't we why don't we go to share screen and I don't know that we need sound, but I'll put it on anyway and see if we can uh, we can get started. Okay, there's a slide. I have quite a quite a big slideshow today. If we don't get to all of it, we'll just do it next week. Okay, start from beginning. It's big file because it's got a lot of uh, pictures, which is something we're doing this week. And the computer I'm using is very slow. My good computer, the uh, the port where you plug in the monitor is broken. I can still use it, but I have to use the small monitor. So I'm using this one as long as it works. So we're on to class three. Uh, at our <clears throat> one of our earlier classes, several people said they were using iPads and we didn't know if you could share screen with an iPad, which I don't have reason to do. But I just uh, Googled it and found out how you share screen on an iPad, which you can see up here. You can also share screens even with an iPhone, which I don't think anybody's just using a phone. Uh, it's a little different because the uh, the share computer is not at the bottom. Share content is not at the bottom of the screen. It's in under the uh, options there or the settings. But you can follow these instructions if you want to use an iPad to share screen. I just thought I'd mention that. Another thing that came up near the end, somebody asked me what was the difference between the different ways that you seem to be getting into the same thing. And I, it is confusing. I'm not sure if what I said was entirely accurate. But uh, <clears throat> using the Bing things, which are the ones that we're doing particularly today, uh, you're finding a number of different ways to get into the same uh, same essential software. You've got Bing Chat. You've got the Bing Image Creator, which is an art generator developed by Bing. It's built into Bing Chat. The Chat GPT is a separate company, but Microsoft is a major owner of it. So they're all sort of related. In the past, it was called DAL-E, which a lot of people use. That's been incorporated into Image Creator. These are things that are changing all the time and new things are coming out. And we will uh, we'll find by experimentation what works for us. Uh, there's also something called Designer, which I've never actually used yet. But it seems to be a program for designing a whole project. Has anybody here used Designer by any chance? I might look at it and have time to look at it. But now you see in the designer, they're incorporating, you can get it to create a picture, you can get it to create pose, prose. So this is a software that was intended to assemble things for you, but now it will also create them. And you're going to see this more and more with the uh, large language models being incorporated in one way or another into other software. Uh, when you look at the actual large language models, there's really two out there that are major, the ChatGPT and the BARD. ChatGPT is what's behind Bing and Bing Image Creator and, and all of that. Those are really the two dominant uh, forces in this field. And there's a good reason for that. It's because it's a very expensive 
field. It requires billions of dollars to build these things. So you're talking about corporations that are putting in tremendous amounts of money. Now, there are others that are less ambitious in that way and more specialized. If you look down on the bottom of the screen, I give you a link to the Wikipedia. Maybe we'll just look at that briefly. Uh, the Wikipedia page on large language models. This is a good place to look if you want to learn more of the theory and, and how it works, particularly if you have a strong technical and mathematical background. Otherwise, you probably won't understand a lot of it. It talks about tokens and actually the programs work with tokens, which are components of words rather than with whole words. I think because of the way we have different endings on words and, and so on. So it, it, that, that's uh, something we may get in a little later to talking about the mechanics of it or the, how it works, which I understand very uh, roughly. I'm not an expert on it by any means. But what I wanted to show you here we can scroll down, here is the list of all the different uh, models that they have. Uh, and when they came out, 2018, BERT came out. Uh, this is a Google project. Google's been working on this for a long time. It has 3.3 billion words. There's ExcelNet, which is another Google project. So Google's been working on this for a long time. There's chat GPT-2, chat GPT-3. So those are different iterations of the open AI pro project. Up to 175 billion words. It's proprietary. This one was done at MIT. There are different collaborations involved. Now, something like the NEO, these are sort of smaller ones that were designed to use less computer power, maybe to run on a mainframe computer rather than up on the cloud with a tremendous uh, amount of resources. Uh, that's what GPTJ is about. So there's all of these you may hear about. Uh, Ernie is, uh, let's see, this is by Baidu. This is the uh, best one to use probably if you happen to be Chinese. But unless you're working in Chinese, you don't really get into that. They are developing their own. Uh, so you can go through and look at look at all of these. Uh, if you find uh, you want to try something, something different, uh, some of these are proprietary and you can't use them. This is the Alexa teacher model. That is Amazon, and Amazon is another major player that may uh, get heavily into this. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little later. They are all behind in the development. So if you look at a lot of these, they're, uh, they're more research oriented. There are companies that are working on it. You may hear about, hear about some of these things as you, uh, as you read about, uh, about uh, large language models. We're not going to deal with those specifically in the class, I don't think, uh, most of them anyway. What we might use is something smaller. This is what we call a tiny language model. This is a language model that's designed to work with children's books with a rather limited vocabulary. <clears throat> now, the advantage of being tiny is just that you require fewer computer resources. Dave sent me a, an email, I think, about the uh, electricity that's gonna be used by these things. And it's a huge amount of just electric power, chips and so on to have these large models running. So you can have a smaller limited model. If your limited model doesn't uh, answer a question, it might reach out to send it over to chat GPT. So a lot of the smaller specialized models use the chat GPT as a backup. Uh, Amazon plans to rework Alexa in the age of chat GPT, relying on its own internally developed model that will power a new, more capable Alexa. Alexa, they have these things that are in your home that you can talk to 
but the uh, the software behind those sort of fell behind. Amazon has, is behind the eight ball. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's only been a year since ChatGPT made its uh, public push. And uh, that was in November of last year in March. Uh, Bard came out and uh, this is all happening very quickly. It's going to keep changing. Uh, so that's just a little uh, background before we get into the specifics for today. I wanted to follow up on some of the things that we did before. Paul gave us these uh, knock knock jokes about Halloween. This is the one that he did. Uh, that's, I guess, chat GPT. I guess I did the same one again. I thought I was doing a comparison, so that's why I got the same thing. Uh, now, that's the oldest knock-knock joke ever. I think I heard that when I was in grade school. But you can always just uh, repeat, and then it gives you another knock-knock joke. Uh, Boo-hoo, the, the ghost says boo. It's a classic Halloween knock-knock joke that's sure to get a laugh out of the kids and adults alike. It gives you a, a sales pitch for it this time. Uh, now, that's what you have to expect. A large language model is not really specialized in coming up with new and original things. It's specialized in coming up with what's most common and repeating what's most common. So that's what you have to expect. But I thought I would try asking it to try to be creative. They, uh, so I told it, I want a joke that no one has used before anywhere on the internet. Now, that might be a challenge for it, but it says, certainly, here's a Halloween knock-knock joke that should be unique. Knock-knock, who's there? Wikipedia. Wikipedia who? Wikipedia, your spell book, and let's brew up some laughter this Halloween. I'm not sure I really get the joke. I don't know if anybody here found it funny or understood it better than I did, but it's trying to do something original. Uh, I asked for another one. Here's an original knock-knock joke for you. Frankenfurter. Frankenfurter who? Frankenfurter a treat? Give me something tasty to eat. I don't know that a sense of humor is really something that, that, uh, that this is good at, we were asked, I think it was Steve who asked what training was. Training is when you ask whether the results are good and how to improve them. And this is where it's using us for training. After I asked for a second response, it said, was this response better or worse or the same? So if I tell it that one is better than the other, it is taking that information and using it to try to perfect its skill in the future. I thought we might try this live in class rather than me doing it in advance. If we pull up the, the chat GPT, which I think is a already open in a window on my computer. <clears throat> Let's say here's chat GPT. And we're gonna start a new joke a new chat. This is where you see the chats here. We had a question we had before, and this is the original Halloween joke. If you right click on your mouse uh, and you see share here, that's how you can share it with somebody. And that gives them the right to collaborate with you on it. But I've had the idea of looking at comedy writing I saw a, uh, an episode of the Marvelous Mrs. Meisel. They had a, a comedy a writer's room where there were like half a dozen writers who worked on a comedy show. And they had a, a practice that they would say 20 and 60. And what that means is that you have 60 minutes to come up with 20 new jokes on a topic. So you're given a topic. And I thought that's quite challenging. We might see how ChatGPT does. Uh, I was thinking maybe I'm going to drop the knock-knock. I think we've had enough knock-knocking. But maybe just uh, Halloween. You're going to have a Halloween party, and you want some jokes. You're going to be the MC. You want some jokes. Uh, so 
I'm not going to ask for some right now. And so I'm going to say, write an original Halloween joke. Well, this is how you can do things to share in class. Call up uh, chat openai.com and uh, then you go down to the bottom of the Zoom window and you go to share screen. And then we'll see what it says. Why did the ghost go to the party? He heard it was going to be a boo last. That's one out of 20. We'll go to regenerate. Why did the ghost go to the party? He heard it was going to be a boo last. How can that be better? It's exactly the same, isn't it? This is the, uh, okay, I'm gonna put down it's the same. This is not doing very well, is it? It's doing the same joke over and over. All right, I'm not gonna go for that. Give me a different joke. If it's not giving me something new, I'll tell it to give me something different. Why did the skeleton go to the barbecue? To get another rib. All right, that one's better, I guess. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know that we can make our living as a now, if I regenerate, I guess it's going to regenerate the skeleton. That's what regenerate does. Why did the vampire get a job at the art store? He was great at drawing blood. Okay, that's a little better. So it's coming up with new things. I, I'm pretty sure that these jokes are not things that it's just finding somebody has used already on the internet. They're new. I'm going to tell it that it's better. So here we are training a large language model uh, by telling it which jokes are better. OK, why did the witch refuse to use a computer? She was afraid of the spell check. OK, that's pretty good. Now, you don't, may not think these are good, but I would challenge you to come up with jokes this fast. Uh, or better jokes. I think that's a difficult skill. I don't think I could get a job where I had to come up with 20 good jokes in an hour on any topic that is thrown out. Uh, it's a rather creative person. So this is where you're using the regenerate and having it uh, come up with something new. Uh, I thought it did pretty well. I'm not going to go through 20. I don't think we need 20 Halloween jokes, but it's something. Uh, I'm going to go back to slideshow. Internet is very slow at my place, so sometimes things take a little time. Okay, this is another challenge that I had. After our class on Fridays, I take the confrontations with the Reaper, where we work about, uh, it's this class on death and dying. And the teacher gave us the assignment of writing our own uh, obituaries. And I thought immediately, well, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to get ChatGP to write my obituary. So here is uh, part of it. This isn't the whole thing. Uh, I happen to have a unique advantage here, I think. Probably I'm the only person here who has a unique name. There are no other Ted Gertzels on the internet. Uh, there are very few Gertzels, and uh, I've never yet found another person with the name Ted Gertzel, which does make it easier for a computer, so I didn't have to, to say which Ted Gertzel. Write a eulogy for Ted Gertzel. Oh, it started writing a eulogy. I think it's overly uh, gilding a lily here. I'm not such a remarkable or unordinary man, a thinker, a scholar. Uh, remember the profound impact he's had uh, and so on. So it's pretty general, but it does reflect the fact that I'm an academic and have a PhD. Further down here, it says his work delved into topics as diverse as artificial intelligence, aging, and futurism, which actually happen to be things that my son has worked on, not things that I'm known in. 
Uh, so it's sort of mixing me up with my son, which surprised me because I did not name my son Ted Gertzel Jr. I think if I had given him the same name, I would understand that, but he has his own name, which is Ben, quite a different name. I decided to try Bard for comparison, and I got some rather bad news. Ted Gertzel, Emeritus Professor in the Sociology Department, Rutgers Camden, and a leading expert on conspiracy theories, which is what I've done, died on October 7th, 2023. So this is the first time I've been informed of my death. That was not terribly good news. I, I, where I pinched myself and decided that it was wrong. <clears throat> I had the evidence and I'm still alive. Uh, otherwise, it went into a lot of rather uh, accurate stuff. I was born in 42. I got my BA and it's got the right schools, the right time. Uh, I tried this also in Bard on the telephone, which I haven't got copied here. And it made major errors by totally confusing me with Ben and jumping all of his things in with mine as if we were one person, which I thought was, uh, was odd given that Bard is connected to Google, it has information. And Ben has a much bigger presence on the internet than me. He's much more known than me, but it's a different name. Uh, then when I went on to look at the rest of my uh, eulogy, it's going on. I went to St. Louis. I began my teaching career at the University of Pennsylvania in 1970. And I have no idea where they got that. I've never had any connection whatsoever to the University of Pennsylvania. Neither has Ben, or as far as I know, any other Gertzel, or a few of us that are academics. I actually started my career at the University of Oregon, which is a totally different institution. Uh, so even with Bard, it, and that's what you have to watch out for, that throws in facts that are just wrong. And if you don't know them, you can't really trust it. I decided to try rewriting. And it's a, well, here's three drafts, but they're all just changing the wording. It's all still about how I just died. This one says I made it to 81 which I guess has to do with 1942 depends on the month of the birthday, it could vary. So that's, uh, on the other hand, this is a useful tool. I once had to write a obituary for one of the men in the Unitarian church. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you feed them the information, it's better rather than just give the name and have them research it. But it, it, it did a pretty good job of, uh, of writing here. I would make it a little less flattering if I were doing it, but other than that, I don't know. Okay, what we're really gonna get on for the rest of most of today is imagery. Uh, this, I got this from Ed Osborne. He tried Bing's image creator using the link I asked for. He asked for a hummingbird uh, with a flower and leaves in the background. And you see, he got a rather nice picture. <clears throat> the other one he asked for was to make a Christmas card with one of my photos on the cover. Christmas scene with snow and horse-drawn sleigh. Uh, and I get lots of free Christmas cards in the mail from charities and stuff. And this is a very typical kind of scene, as good as you get on those cards. He says he doesn't think people would believe this is a real photo. I'm not sure why. I think it's too good in the sense that there's no junk cluttering up the background, which is very hard to get in a real photo. Uh, but if you want it to look like a real photo, you can give it commands that would tell it to make it look like a real photo. We'll get into that later today, the specific commands which are very specific and uh, detailed if you happen to know the jargon of photography. Uh, so you can tell it to make it like a 50 millimeter lens and uh, 35 millimeter film and a lot of things that I don't understand. The nice thing about uh, Image Creator, however, is you do not have to look in the manual of the program and see what powers it has, what it can do, you don't have to adapt your commands to it. You can express it in your own words and pretty much it will understand. 
so it's able to figure it out. Uh, and you could make a picture that would design to look like one that was made with a real camera. Uh, I have not tried to do that, and I don't know how successful it would be, but there are things you could do to make it that way. Now, if you go on the internet, you can find all kinds of pictures like this of hummingbirds. In my Brazil class, I got a whole bunch of pictures of the uh, flower kissers of Brazil. That's the word in Portuguese, a beixa flor. They're called flower kissers. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount there, but those are all owned by somebody. This one is yours. It belongs to you in the sense that uh, image creator is not going to come back and say, you violated our copyright. It's going to say, yes, you, uh, you can use this picture. I don't know if you can copyright it. If you were to publish a book of pictures of hummingbirds, uh, you say that you had created them or not, that is a gray area in the law. It's not been ruled upon. Uh, you could change the type of bird. There are all kinds of species and colors of hummingbirds. You could tell it what kind of hummingbirds you want. You could, you could specify a lot of things if you wanted to. Uh, this also gets into the question of what's real and what's fake. And there's something new. This is very new. Actually, I got this from this morning's New York Times. So this is something that is just becoming available today. Google, which has long been an industry leader in smartphone photography, will on Thursday, that's today, start shipping the Pixel 8. For $700, you get a handset with a suite of AI-powered photo editing tools. The phone software does much more than adjust the sharpness and brightness of a photo. It uses AI to generate imagery or remove elements to give you exactly what you want. I don't know how far this can go, but you can cut people out. If you've got somebody in your picture you wish wasn't there, you can say, delete that person. It deletes them, but it fills in the background of what it thinks was probably behind them. So you wouldn't even see that they were there. Say if their shoulder was cut off, you could move them and it would regenerate another shoulder. Generally on the assumption that one shoulder is a mirror image of the other, so it probably can do that pretty uh, pretty easily. Uh, and in this story that's in today's paper, he gives some examples. These are pictures he took of his dog. He was in a dog park. And apparently a policeman came along and wrote him a summons for letting his dog run off leash without a permit in the dog park. He mentions that because if you look at the left photo on the rock there on the right, you will see the summons is lying there. He put it down on the rock. He didn't really want it there. So he erased it. So you just blot out, you know, the area you want to delete. And it fills in uh, what it logically thinks would have been behind it. And you see a picture without that defect. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, two of his dogs. And you see one of the dogs is not quite in the frame. So you don't see the whole dog. Now, what he did is he moved the dog over to the left. And it shows the whole thing. Now, he says it's a bit fuzzy. The, the dog's rear is a little unclear. But it looks like the dog is really there. I think he probably moved it too far, but he's just trying to demonstrate what this will do. So this is the sort of thing that AI will do. In this case, it's AI that's actually built into a phone. It's not depending on getting onto the internet and sending it somewhere. Uh, so the distinction between a real picture and an AI-generated picture is going to become more and more blurry as the technology develops. And uh, you'll be able, of course, you can upload pictures you have into software and edit them. That's what MJ wanted to do. I don't know of any free uh, internet only software that's good for that as yet. You can go into, like you talk about the Photoshop, which has been around forever, but Photoshop is incorporating these LLM 
uh, tools into Photoshop. So as you use Photoshop, which people who work with images a lot generally use that, you will be able to incorporate these techniques into that and modify your pictures, uh, which you've already done a little. You're able to remove a blemish or something. But you know, if you just cut something out, it'll put in more skin to replace it. So that's the uh, that's a new technology that's become available today. Uh, if anybody wants to buy one and try it out, you can share your results with us within the week, I suppose. Uh, this is a letter I got from MJ. I don't know, MJ, are you uh, here? She wasn't here when I looked. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, she, you've already seen this. She's using, she was using crayon, which is one that I had recommended. Uh, for curriculum development. She teaches a kindergarten and first grade class in Uganda uh, with Zoom. So that's something that with Zoom, you can be teaching kindergarten kids in Uganda. They're black African. She doesn't want to use material that's all blonde, blue-eyed children or adults. Uh, and she was looking at kindergarten worksheets to go with a book, Joseph and the Rainbow Robe. And there are several books like that. Uh, and she found a worksheet she wanted to use, but it was too difficult. So she wanted to make it easier. She said she couldn't get the program to generate a picture of Joseph and his coat of many colors, or even to insert kitten objects. Uh, I'm not sure why she had that trouble, but I tried doing it. And first of all, this is the picture she started with. Now you see, this is just black and white. Uh, and I, I think if you look at the bottom, there's a picture of the objects and then the, the game for the students is to look in the picture and find the objects and they learn, they learn that. Uh, I guess that, uh, that guy, I don't know if he's white or what he is, he's not black necessarily. Uh, so I've been playing around with this a bit. I had said that chat GPT could edit pictures now, but I had misread this. It says you can talk to it. It'll talk to you, but it does not have the capability to have you enter a picture and edit it, unfortunately. We do have, however, Bing Image Creator, which is the one that I'm pushing. You see here, I've got 99 credits here. It's free. You get 99 credits when you sign up. If you use it a lot, they're going to start charging you. Uh, I decided to try it. First thing I got is we can't create your image right now. We're too busy. So you may run into that. It's apparently getting a lot of use. The prompt I had was an image of Joseph and his suit of many colors. So I just tried it again in about uh, 20 seconds and it did work. And I got the picture here you see on the, on the left. Uh, so it produced a picture of Joseph in a suit of many colors. Uh, now that's, uh, nobody knows what Joseph or any of these biblical characters really look like. Uh, so you can imagine whatever you want. By and large, they were not Scandinavian. So you don't really think you're going to have a real blonde, uh, light-skinned person. But I said, why don't we get a black person? instead of a white person. Uh, and I did succeed in doing that with crayon. So if you look at crayon, if you look at the one on the right, if you look on the lower right-hand corner, you see the symbol of a crayon. That's how you know this was produced by crayon. Uh, Chat GPT does not put anything on the picture that tells you it was generated by their company. Uh, but it came up with a black African looking man wearing a jacket of many colors. I don't think there's a description in the Bible or any place about what his jacket looked like or what he looked like. And uh, you know, Christianity has long roots in Ethiopian places. He could well be a, a black person. So I was able to get these, these pictures. I was not able to get ChatGPT to change, say, to take this picture and substitute a black person. I tried an image of a black Joseph in his suit of many colors, and I got these. 
which are something different. They don't look like a real person. They're more of uh, iconic artworks and so on. They're not bad necessarily. They're, uh, they're uh, nice enough pictures, but they're not what I was looking for. Whereas this one probably was. This is as good as I think the pictures, if you <clears throat> search for pictures of Joseph in his coat of many colors. There are lots of them out there. <clears throat> and of course, MJ already copies a lot of pictures from other places. The problem with that could be that you run into copyright problems because somebody owns it. If you were publishing it, it would be a problem. I don't think using for a class in, of students in Uganda, that's not a problem. I always copy things for our church newsletter. Uh, so there's lots of pictures out there. Uh, I decided to try an image of a man looking like Barack Obama in a suit of many colors. And it gave me a content warning. I can't do that. This violates their content policy. I think because I, I mentioned a real person or a, uh, a <clears throat> celebrity, uh, I didn't ask for Barack Obama, I just thought if I said looking like Barack Obama, that would say the image of a handsome uh, black man. But uh, that didn't work with uh, chat GP, with uh, Bing image creator either. If you go online, you can find a lot of different pictures. That's These are pictures that somebody has done. I didn't have much luck, however, online finding any black uh pictures this this one here looks sort of dark when you look close it, he's not scandinavian white but he's not not black uh here i said create a stick figure of a black joseph delivering a sermon in a coat of many colors and that's not bad i don't it may not be what mj wants for her purposes uh, and then it has all the the pencils down on the bottom you could crop those out if you didn't want them so, you know, you can get a lot of stuff. Getting exactly what you want is a lot more, often a lot more difficult. Uh, this uh, led me to think about a picture of Jesus. I you know we, you often see pictures of Jesus that he is blonde, blue-eyed, Scandinavian. I wanted to see if you could get Jesus Christ as a person of color. And this came right up. You notice it came with the uh, rainbow flag and the dove of peace as well, which I didn't ask for. You could go through and ask to have those deleted or changed if you wanted. Uh, this is not a new idea. You can find this online. If I, I search for images of Jesus as a person of color, plenty of people have, have thought of that. And <clears throat> we have absolutely no historical knowledge of what Jesus looked like, so you can Take your pick, I guess. But these are all done by an artist. They're not done by a computer, and somebody has the rights to them. Okay. Dad. 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 Yeah. I think I think the one third to the left was the one created by National Geographic when they looked at the uh, biblical writings and the uh, anthropological evidence of the people living in that area at that time, the one third from the left. The third from the left on the, what? Well, and this one here, you mean, on this slide. Yeah, well, it, it's true that, you know, 2000 years ago, populations were pretty homogeneous. So the people in one part of the country probably all had fairly similar uh, skin color and features, unlike today where the populations are all mixed and people fly all over the world and, and so on. So you could probably make a guess as to what Jesus looked like as a in terms of what was the predominant anthropological type at the time. I don't know that I could have gotten chat GPT to do that better. I couldn't get it to do it at all. I may be a crayon, but uh, it's just an experiment here. The other thing I decided to try was, picking up on MJ's problem, create 
a uh, find the hidden object puzzle appropriate for kindergarten students. Okay, so chat GPT knows what a find the hidden object puzzle is and apparently it produced them. It doesn't, didn't produce them in black and white stick figures. If that's what you wanted, I suppose you could ask for it. I didn't try that. It gave a number. Uh, you can see that the humans that are in the pictures are all Caucasian. I, don't, I think the one on the upper right doesn't have any people in the lower left, but the, the ones that do, they may have too many objects uh, for uh, MJ's class. Uh, so I tried again, create a find the hidden object puzzle appropriate for kindergarten students with a black boy and girl in the center. And I did come up with these. One of them has a white girl and a black boy rather than both black. Uh, one of them is a black boy and a sort of brown girl. Then we got a, two that are black and the other two. Uh, maybe it has too many objects. So I said, create a find the hidden object puzzle appropriate for kindergarten students with 10 hidden objects and a black boy and girl in the center. <clears throat> so I came out with this one, uh, which might meet the need. Now, of course, it doesn't have a key to it as to what the objects are. You would have to make that up. I think you could go through and list the objects you want, and it would probably put them in. I haven't tried that. But uh, if you wanted to have a list of the 10 objects and what they should be, you could put that in. Now, one of the things I found is your prompts can be of any length. And some people do prompts that are like a page or two pages of material, telling it exactly what you want it to do. Not so much with pictures as with writing, which we'll get to next week. We won't be doing that this week. But uh, you can... You can type in a lot of information. You don't just have to have a one paragraph or one sentence prompt and tell it what you want. And if you don't get what you want, you can have it do it again. Now with the image creator, you will use up your points if you keep doing that. And pretty soon it'll say, by the way, you better feed in your credit card and start uh, paying for this, which could be a disadvantage. Uh, and of course, they can change the funding model at any time. But right now, you <clears throat> can do a fair amount. I thought this was useful. I don't know uh, if it's what MJ would want. What, what do you think, MJ? Do you have a reaction to this one? Or um, So a couple things. Um, first of all, if I was going to give another prompt, I would say give me a black and white. because. Um, the images that I'm looking for are copied and given to individual students. And I have like 120 students. And so to do a color copy like this would not work well. Uh, so, you know, you might just do the uh, prompt of, uh, give me a black mm -hmm. and white image. Um, yeah, uh, as you said, there isn't a key and there's a, a lot of stuff in there. Usually a hidden picture is, you know, you have a scene of, you know, people going on a picnic or something. And, you know, the hidden objects are, you know, made to look like part of the tree or part of the picnic uh -huh. basket or something. This is, you know, you've got some objects. They're not exactly hidden. They're just there. Yeah, <laughs> or, you know, you could, you know, say, okay, fine. You could circle the flower or you could circle the ball or you could circle uh, the hat or something. But that's not what I typically uh, consider a, a hidden object picture. But you know, it's interesting that it does that, and it's really good to know that it will do that. I think, you know, I will experiment and give it yeah. a try. Yeah, you try telling it that's what you want and see how it does. I, I have not tried it, and I, I, you know, as you say, you can experiment with this just as, as well as I can. I have no particular gift for it, so... Uh, <clears throat> But uh, we're getting a lot of, of interesting stuff, which would be very hard to do if you tried to do it on your own. 
Now, there have been some articles about this. This is one, I, I think, maybe one that Dave Kress sent me. AI was asked to create images of black African docs treating white kids. And it seemed unable to do that. Uh, there are lots and lots of pictures of white doctors treating African kids. You see this coming from the, the organization Doctors Without Frontiers that you know, you get doctors who volunteer their services to go to poor countries and offer uh, medical help. And that's a charity you can give money to, uh, which is fine. But there probably are not so many cases of black doctors uh, helping white children. They finally found this one, but it's actually a, a uh, traditional healer. It wasn't a modern doctor. And it created that picture. But uh, basically, as it points out, the pictures that the, that the uh, LLM produces are remixes of existing content. And there's a long history of photos that depict suffering people of color and white Western health aid workers. So if you want something that there's not been a lot done, uh, it's not going to be so good. It's going to rehash things that have been done. And that's the nature of long, large language models, uh, both with the pictures and with words. You know, it's, it learns by imitation, uh, which is how, probably how people learn. We learn by, to speak by imitating how our parents and siblings speak and so on. And uh, coming up with something unusual or creative is is more of a challenge. Okay, another uh, software that's out there that's often recommended is MidJourney, uh, which is something that is recommended in a lot of books a lot of people have used to generate high grade AI images levering the cloud. Uh, this is an article from way back on May 10th, 2023, which doesn't seem so long ago. This is from a technical article, and it talks about how to generate high-grade images leveraging the cloud. Uh, I found that's a very useful article, and we're going to explore some of that today. Uh, but it, I didn't find that it worked so well with MidJourney as, as it did even with the uh, with the uh, image creator that we've been using. Uh, Midjourney is, uh, is something I had not looked into before. It's an independent research lab exploring new mediums of thought and expanding the imaginative powers of the human species. They're a small self-funded team, 11 full-time staff. And what it is, it's a social network. If you sign on to it, you join the MidJourney community on Discord. Discord is a, a software that you have to install on your computer. You don't just go into it on the web and you have your username and you affiliate with it. And uh, there are different groups that you can join. One of the, several of the groups are like new people that are just trying it out. But then there are groups that are specialized in all kinds of pictures. And that's, uh, that is, uh, I think, a very interesting place to go if you want to share ideas and meet other people who share your interests, which what the interests are available there, I haven't investigated. Uh, there might be teachers and kindergarten teachers that are preparing things on there. Uh, it does cost money after a while. Right now, though, you can get on for free for a certain amount of time before it starts costing you, uh, costing you money. These are some sample pictures that they have on their website, which show... Uh, pictures that people have made on mid-journey. And that's, uh, you know, they're pretty good pictures. They're similar to the ones you get with other kinds of uh, kinds of software. Now, Kim, I think Kim is here today, aren't you, Kim? I saw you 
I don't get a list of who's here when I'm on screen share. She I'm sent here. me a uh, a file with her experiments with Midjourney, trying to get a picture of Jane Austen typing on a computer. So let's see if we can get this to come up. Okay, this is the uh, the file that she sent me. I just shrank the pictures a little to try to get things on one page. Midjourney is a free AI image generating software her stepson recommended. She trying to get the image she wanted. Uh, Jane Austen typing on a computer. And uh, now we're stuck with my slow computer. It's going to take a while to load this in. I assume it's going to load it in. Yeah, now here it is. Would it be easier if I shared, oh, if I shared from my iPad? I don't know. You can do that. Would you like to do it that way? My internet connection is unstable. I'm I getting. Give it a uh, try. Let's try that and see. Let's see. I have to go back okay. to. Uh, let me see. I'll go back to the. Uh, I got to get back into Zoom somehow so I can. This computer is very slow. Okay, here is screen sharing. I'm going to stop my screen share. And to uh, share screen, and I say multiple participants can share simultaneously. Okay, why don't you see if you could share your screen? Otherwise, we're almost to break time. We could play with that on during the break if you have trouble with it. I need to call your instructions back up. Okay. I, I've never done it on an here. iPad. I don't have an iPad. My wife has one, but I don't, she doesn't do Zoom on it. Hmm. Okay. I'm not getting a share iPad or share screen at the bottom of my iPad screen. So, hmm. Maybe not going to work. Let me see. I don't know. It said the first thing was to, you know, be on Zoom and then go down and choose share screen. Oh, uh, I don't have any experience with using an iPad, so I don't. Uh... Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's five I'm minutes till four. Why don't we take our 10 minute break now? And you can fiddle with that. And if you can't get it to work in 10 minutes, I'll go back. I do have the one you emailed me that I can show people. So okay. let's take our 10 minute break. We'll come back at five after four. That'll give uh, Kim some time to experiment with this. I'm not going to close the uh, Zoom, but I am going to pause the recording. So we won't be recording here. And it gives you a chance to, uh, to see if you can get that to work here. Okay, class is now officially back in action. Go ahead and tell us about your experiences here. Yeah. Okay, well, I uh, was uh, recommended by my stepson to try Mid Journey because I had never heard of it. And so I did. And uh, I typed in the prompt, um, Jane Austen typing on a computer. And they have different levels of imagery. Um, this is the one, the one it's showing now is what they call quote unquote normal. Um, the next photo you're gonna see is the one they call realistic. But Jane Austen typing on a computer, uh, that doesn't look like a computer to me. <laughs> It looks more like a typewriter keyboard, um, and there's no monitor. Uh, the other problem I had with it is that her dress is the wrong period. Um, she was um, 
She lived during what we term the Regency period, which um, was in the early 1800s in England. And the dresses were not at the normal waist. They were high-waisted. So uh, I made another attempt to get a more accurate picture. And this is what I got for the second attempt. This is in what they call the realistic mode. Again, I got a typewriter. <laughs> the dress is a little more accurate, um, but I wasn't you know, satisfied with that. Um, so this one, to get this one, I had typed in uh, Jane Austen wearing an empire waist dress typing on a computer. Um, prior to doing this, I typed in Jane Austen wearing a Regency era dress typing on a computer, and it wouldn't give me anything for that. I suspect it didn't understand what was meant by Regency era. Uh, but when I said high-waisted dress, then I got this picture. Uh, again, you know, no computer, it's a typewriter. So I tried again. Uh, so uh, the next attempt was um, Jane Austen wearing a high-waisted dress, typing on a computer keyboard. <laughs> I got a keyboard, but it's a piano keyboard. And there's something on top of the piano that looks like it could be an iPad. But um, anyway, this is in the normal mode, not the realistic mode. So I tried yet again, and I typed in Jane Austen wearing a high-waisted dress using a computer with a monitor. And this is what I got. <laughs> that uh, has got the monitor, but the keyboard is again a piano keyboard. Well, it's, it's certainly not a computer keyboard. So at this point, I just kind of gave up. Um, you know, I the one thing that I had to say about it is that they did a pretty good job, um, except for the first one, in getting the details that you'll find of her appearance on the internet. They got those right because she was a brunette with dark eyes and uh, dark hair and dark hazel eyes. And, um, and that is the hairstyle that they show in the pictures is appropriate for that era. And uh, let me show you what, this is the only known portrait of Jane Austen and what she actually looked like. And it was drawn by her sister. It's an amateur sketch and people artists um, and various people have tried to figure out what she actually looked like. So just to share with you some other um, attempts at figuring out what Jane Austen looked like, uh, these were created by a forensic artist, a painting and a wax figure. Um, and then this is another artist's attempt to figure out what she actually looked like. So I thought uh, the AI did not do a bad job on her especially the last one on her face and her appearance, but the, we had a real problem with um, the, the computer, which surprised me. I never did get an actual computer. I got monitor and piano keyboard. I got piano keyboard. I got typewriter and typewriter. So apparently when I used the word typing, it gave me a typewriter. And when I used the word um, keyboard, I got a piano and I could not, uh, I didn't have time, but I just couldn't figure out a way to make it give me what I really wanted. So that's that's it. And I'll stop sharing now if that's okay. Now, is the screen sharing stopped? Yeah. Okay.
Uh, here I am talking, and I didn't unmute myself. I was wondering if you <laughs> shared this with your stepson, you said, who, who advised you on this, and why he thinks about mid-journey, what his experiences have been. Have you, did, did you get any information like that? I, I did not share this with him. I did it um, <laughs> I did it last night, and it would have been too late to contact <clears throat> him. Um, he just he he has an internet business. Um, he sells things on the internet, so he works a lot with images on the internet, I guess. And he just recommended this as something he'd used and and liked, but it mm -hmm. was just a general recommendation, nothing really specific. Well, <clears throat> you might talk to him if he'd like to come uh, a speaker in our class sometime on Zoom and tell us about his experiences. I'd be, uh, we could, we would be interested, I'm sure. So, so think about that as a possibility for the uh, future. Okay. Let me go I'll back to my screen share for a minute because I want to follow up on this, and then we'll go to uh, experiments that he's engaging in right now. This is her experiment with it. I just thought you might like to see what I got with uh, Bing Image Creator, Jane Austen typing on a computer. I think this one is uh, pretty good. What do you think? <clears throat> I think it's a more reasonable result than what I got. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a, a computer. Why she's using that? She's got a quill pen. She's making some notes, but she does have a, a computer. And uh, I guess it sort of looks like her based on the picture that you had. It's probably how women might have dressed at, at that time. So perhaps it's, uh, perhaps it's pretty good, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> This is something I got from the uh, from the uh, article that I talked about that we're going to go into later when we we have a little time. It talked about using uh, Midjourney to generate high quality images, and the interesting thing that it does is it gives you the prompts, and the prompts are ones that. Uh, are much more specific and more technical than the sorts of things we're talking about. It said prompt, fantasy landscape, atmospheric, hyper-realistic, 8K, epic composition, cinematic, octane render, art station landscape, vista photography, <clears throat> 16K resolution. You can see it up there, landscape, veduta photo, 8K resolution. The scale landscape painting, deviant art, flicker, rendered in Enscape. I don't know what all these things are. Uh, and I don't know if any of you do. Maybe your uh, your stepson would know if he works a lot with art <clears throat> and so on. But you can put in <clears throat> very uh, technical uh criteria you could do this for your painting of hummingbirds or whatever tell it you know what type of photo resolution you want what you would like uh, in the background you can you can give it samples say make it similar to a certain uh, book of hummingbird paintings <clears throat> the nice thing about uh, large language models is you don't have to get out the manual and look up and see what the uh, what the uh, software requires, as you do with uh, traditional programs, that it can do this and that. But this is how you tell it to do it. Those of us who've been using computers for years, you know, we're used to learning the commands that it accepts and so on. And you can pretty much type in any command that you want in your own words, and it will probably know what it means, and it will figure it out. So. If you happen to be really uh, an expert on uh, illustrations, you can use that expertise and you could study it up, get a book on uh, how to do that sort of thing. Uh, the interesting thing that I wanted to try 
was to try putting this into uh, Bing Image Creator, which uh, is not what the article was about. It said using it into the, the other software. But I took exactly the same prompts, which I don't understand myself, and put them into the, uh, the image creator. And it suggested these four pictures, which look uh, reasonable. Here's a bigger version of it. So it was, you can use those same prompts that are in that article. You don't have to go to mid-journey. Uh, you can, and MidJourney probably is great for certain things that it knows about. It didn't happen to know about uh, Jane Austen. I don't know why it couldn't have put a computer with a picture of her, though, rather than a a uh, piano with a key, with a monitor on it. But you can use all of these these same prompts with the. Uh, the Bing image creator, which is the one that I've had so far the best uh, results with. Uh, so I would uh, I would recommend trying that. I wanted to go over some of that article it was the next thing I had in mind. But before we do that, uh, let's ask, uh, look at what George has for us. I'm going to share. And uh, it's still set up to allow uh, participant sharing. Multiple participants can share. So uh, George, why don't you go ahead and show us what you got? Well, it's not an image, but it's a uh, question I raised a few minutes ago was, can it uh, um, identify what the uh, endpoint of the war between Israel and Hamas will be. And you said it can't do anything in current events. <clears throat> so I asked about what the uh, ideas are for uh, resolution of the dispute between Israel and Palestine. And I thought it gave 14 pretty good ideas. No, if you can make the uh, the text a little larger, I don't know what software you're showing it in here, is or just uh, enlarge your screen or something. Uh, the other direction, larger, not smaller. Okay, there I can read that. Oops. Hmm. Is that better? Yeah, that's all right. We can read some of it to us. It's we got the different solutions: the two-state solution, yeah. local swaps, international mediation. Okay, it's going through all of the things that have been suggested that are being tried, or that have been tried over the years, right? Yeah. And I've done some work on conflict resolution myself. And these seem like uh, ideas that have already been surfaced, although not implemented. Of course, in the current situation, uh, all these ideas would not be realistic. But the, these might be approaches that can be done after the uh, current war is resolved or mitigated in some way. <clears throat> of course, the obvious point is that uh, these things have not worked. And that's not, is it being creative and suggesting something new? Or is it outlining all of the sort of standard stuff that's there in the literature, which is what I would anticipate it would do? Yeah, I think the latter. Just a long list of things that have been recommended but not necessarily implemented. And whether uh, they can be implemented, is there something different that, uh, if you try to ask it to come up with something, if you still got it up, why don't you try saying, can you suggest a new way of resolving the conflict that has not yet been tried and see if it comes up with anything? Okay. Uh, 
was one of the things with these is that you don't have to just take the first result. You know, you get a result, you interact with it, view it as like your assistant and it's helping you. Well, the other what thing you, you, you want me to say well, an idea that's not been tried before. I don't think anybody has tried this, these things this much. So, I mean, it's not like there's a lot of experience with using it in this way. <clears throat> well, you want me to ask, what are some ideas about resolving the Palestinian-Israeli dispute that have not been tried before? Is that what you want me to ask? Yeah, I thought we might try that. Getting a good list of what has been tried is a useful thing. I've got, but sort of like coming up with a new joke instead of the old knock knock joke. Yeah. Yeah, these are uh, new ideas. And they're kind of a uh, novel. Well, maybe we'll give you some time to work on this and come back with it next week. We don't have to do it right now if you want. Yeah, sure. Go, go ahead. I don't want to hold you up. It's up to you. I mean, it's not that we're in such a big rush. Let me show you some other stuff and then we can come back. But we, we can do these things next week, too. It's no, There's no uh, urgency about it. I doubt that the conflict will have been the time we uh, come back next week. Okay, I wanted to, as our last thing today, to look at this uh, article, how to use mid-journey to create AI images. This is really how to uh, create AI images with other software as well. So it works. I think what's here works just as well with the with the Bing image creator. This is a a, a magazine online called TechSpot. There's lots of information out there about these things. Uh, and this is what I am suggesting that you uh, look at to read over the uh, Next week, if you want to work more with uh, with uh, imagery rather than words, first thing you will need is a Discord account. I was talking about getting on to Midjourney. I'm going to skip that part because I think all of this works just all with the Bing Image Creator, which was not available when it uh, when the guy wrote this article. So he, at the time, the Midjourney was probably the best thing available. Uh, the image generator supports a number of commands and parameters to adjust what and how it manages the process, most of which you add after descriptive text. You don't need to use these as by default, it will use the latest public model and create 512 by 512 pictures. Now that's true with the Bing image creator too. You do not have to do any of this. You can just type in, give me a picture of Jane Austen at a computer and leave it at that. But if you want to refine and develop what you get, you can begin to put in some of these things. Version or dash V will change which model gets used. So you might tell it whether you want GPT-4, GPT-3, 
Style can be used to tweak model versions if you're looking for further variations. Uh, this is calling for different models. I don't really work with imagery, so I don't know too much of these things. But these are things that people who are more serious about imagery know about. Aspect will change the ratio of width to height of images. Uh, you could try that with, uh, I'm pretty sure that all of these things would work also with Bing Image Creator. If you prefer a three to two or 16 to 19, 16 by 10. Chaos will alter how creative the images will be with higher values, giving you increasingly more oddball results. Stylize adjusts how closely the generator sticks to the prompt. The fault value is 100. Whether any of these things work exactly this way with uh, other software or not, I don't know. Of course, you're welcome to sign up for MidJourney if you want to try MidJourney. There's, it might work well for something other than Jane Austen at the computer. I don't want to dispense with it all together. Using images instead of prompts. MidJourney can also use images instead of text to create new pieces of art. Instead of typing imagine, in mid-journey you type imagine when you want to get something, you type blend and then you upload several pictures. Now this could presumably be something like the uh, hidden uh, object uh, puzzles. You could upload in mid-journey, apparently you could upload several pictures of them and ask it to, uh, to blend them. Maybe you could ask it to modify them in certain ways. Uh, I don't think <clears throat> uh, Bing Image Creator offers that. See here, there's uh, you've got different pictures of somebody, and it blends them together and creates another one. Okay. Uh, what I thought was particularly interesting here is to look at the prompts, because this is how a real professional high-tech image creator uh, uses prompts. Group of male Norse, Dane, and Vikings hit, huddled together and is taking a group selfie picture together in 793 Common Era. They are drinking ale at a feast in a Viking longhouse. They are all wearing traditional Viking armor and helmets. Everyone smiling directly at the camera. The image is photorealistic. That's a type of <clears throat> image. If you want something to look like a photograph, Say, I want a photorealistic image, has natural lighting, and is taken with a front-facing phone selfie camera by one of the Vikings. And then when it says the uh, dash dash IR, that's aspect ratio three to two. Uh, so it's feeding in various parameters in order to get the image that exactly what he wanted. Uh, this is the one for the fantasy landscape, which is the one I clipped out to put in my uh, slideshow. So if you look at the words, fantasy landscape, atmospheric, hyper-realistic, epic composition, cinematic, octane render. I don't know if there's anybody here in this class who knows what all these terms mean. I don't. But uh, maybe uh, maybe Ed said he's an amateur photographer. Maybe he knows some of these or somebody else here. Uh, detailed landscape painting, deviant art. But these are not terms that are inherent to the particular uh, software. These are terms that are used by people in this field and that it is uh, <clears throat> understanding when you put it in. So you don't want to underestimate what it will understand. A cyborg bikini model. Imagine a cyborg bikini model facing the camera. She's very tall, standing 100 meters high above much smaller buildings. 35 millimeter film. Aspect ratio 16 to 9. Now that should give a image that should look as if this woman was actually standing on this building and you shot a picture with a 35 millimeter film. It's a certain rectangular shape. It's uh, 
imitating <clears throat> what you would have gotten with a real photograph photograph. Maybe Ed will try that with his uh, uh, bird pictures or something else. See if you try putting in some of these prompts and project it again, see what you get. Street style fashion photo, full body shot of a Portuguese man with black hair and a full beard. Okay, so that man looks Portuguese, I guess. He could be a lot of other nationalities too, but he could certainly be Portuguese. Walking with a crowd of people on a sidewalk in Dubai while holding his leather laptop case, wearing a royal blue Dulce and Gabbana blazer and white button up sunset lighting. And it's giving the aspect ratio. It wants it stylized. If you read through this article, it may tell you what some of these things mean. Now, this might be something you could even use if you were creating advertising and trying to sell a particular blazer. You could, uh, it, it, you could get it to, to just put in a particular thing. Somebody, say, who's into marketing could use it to uh, create marketing pictures. Here it's asking for Elon Musk dressed in skin-tight leopard print with a leopard scarf and a walking cane inviting you to get pretty little ah uh, in the car. That's pretty little ah uh, in the car as he waves you into his Cadillac Escalade. Maybe these are some slang terms that I don't know. It seems to, on uh, mid-journey, pick a actual person, Elon Musk, which uh, I think the, uh, the Bing image creator would probably say that wasn't allowed. Now, this is the sort of thing that could be used to uh, post on the internet and say, look at what's this guy uh, who's progressive is wearing a leopard shirt. He was photographed. And in actuality, it's completely made up. So you could see that in politics, you could use this to create false images of people uh, doing things that they, they shouldn't do or, or they conflict with their ideology or whatever. Okay, here is one that's called Extreme Graphics Card. Highly detailed photo of a graphics card in a powerful PC. Bright colors, RGB lights, lots of cooling fans, glass panels, high resolution, ultra detailed, vivid colors, neon lighting, dark background, Floodlight. Now, what these things are, GeForce Ryzen, I don't know. But <clears throat> you are generating a picture that could illustrate an article of some kind. Now, this came up uh, yesterday. I don't know if any of you are in the, uh, the class on banned books. But uh, Jim Moon asked, when you're talking about graphic novels, these are novels where they're, uh, they're sort of halfway like comic books. They have text, but each page also has pictures. And Jim asked, you know, do the people who write these graphic novels just write the words and hire an illustrator, or do they paint them, them draw them themselves? Uh, the structure said that generally people who do graphic novels are also artists and draw the pictures because it's hard to get somebody to uh, to do exactly what you want, to understand what you're doing. Uh, I would think you could write, produce the pictures for a graphic novel with this software. It would raise problems if you were trying to publish it, whether you can copyright it. I don't think you can copyright something that's just the output of a uh, LLM, although this is a gray area. There's not legislation about it. I hope you're, this is coming through. My computer keeps saying your internet connection is unstable, which it often is out here at my house. Uh, <clears throat> here's a moose painting, which is somewhat nature painting, more like what Ed does, does except we don't have moose right around here. <clears throat> This is a Megan Duncanson style painting. Now, this is something you can do with writing as well as with pictures. You can mention 
a particular artist or a particular writer and say, go with that style. Or you can do something with the style of the St. James uh, translation of the Bible. I, I'm going to a poetry dinner through my church on Saturday. Uh, maybe instead of just getting a poem out of a book, I'll have it write a poem about our church in the language of the uh, Bible and see what it can come up with. So you can tell it to mimic what you want. If you want a certain style, go for that. And uh, it will probably know what it is. It's not like you have to explain what it is. If you want a huge antlers with a snow-capped mountain lake with reflection in the background, early stages of sunset, psychedelic effects. So that's what they asked for to get this picture. Now, these were all done on mid-journey. Uh, similar, you could try it and see if it works on other, uh, other software. Now, why somebody wanted this picture, I'm not sure. It doesn't look like such a great picture to me, but two 80s looking photos added as a prompt. So apparently it fed in photos for it to look at, which you can do in mid-journey. Hood, corner of age lighting, natural, slightly cinematic, not long summers, visual style, photorealistic photograph perspective is two point and scene has a crisp film photography feel style of Martin Parr. Who knows what the style of Martin Parr is? I would say that uh, probably being image creator knows. Composition of style of David Hockney. So there it's telling it to image and mock, use, copy the style of certain uh, photographers or artists, people who are well known. Uh, it's telling you this is done with a Hasselblad lens, 120 millimeter film stock, Cine Style 50D. Now that's not something that. Uh, it's actually done with it is imitating what comes out with that kind of a camera grainy vintage time of day late afternoon now that makes it look more presumably look more like it could have been taken with an actual camera as opposed to being a a made-up photograph i hear you've got this uh, somebody's leg sticking up you, you got things that you maybe don't want that makes it look more like a real photograph you always get get things like that in a real photograph full body portrait of a beautiful woman with blonde hair standing in a flower field shot in a backlighting scenario during the golden hour i think the golden hour is uh close to sunset when the uh sunlight is particularly colorful 50 millimeter lens on a medium format camera to achieve a cinematic look. Colors should be rich and vibrant with a focus on Hasselblad style tones. I could search and find out, but who knows what a Hasselblad style tone is. Uh, he didn't say anything about what she should be wearing. <clears throat> so it <clears throat> made its own decision on it, apparently. Interior of a room, photograph of the interior of a living room, large mirror, flowers, cream walls. Now you see it asks for soft light, like hyper-realistic high resolution. Rendered in octane, I don't know what that means. Uh, you have to, if you're really into computer graphics, I guess you learn these things. Well, I don't know why it's turning blue there. I... Okay, there's a white Porsche. Porsche has two syllables. It's my brother-in-law, sister-in-law. I call it a Porsche, they complain. Uh, Dotanbori, Osaka in the background. That's a street in Osaka, Japan. Fine art, cinematic, automated photography. Ultra realism. <clears throat> I guess the fact that it's got all these things on it, uh, the text and so on are not specified in the prompt. It simply put that in. 
Now here you're getting a simple black and white photograph of a tree, dark background, high resolution, floodlight. You might think that this is something that uh, was produced with a camera and uh, special effects that the photographer is doing. Okay, so you get the idea here that you can go through and put in what you want. And it doesn't have to be a sentence. It doesn't have to be just a paragraph. It could be even more than what you have here. You want gleaming white teeth as they pose for the camera. Uh, it did not produce gleaming white teeth, did it? I don't see the teeth. <clears throat> so you may not get what you actually want. We did better with the uh, Bing than they did with this on the uh, uh, <clears throat> looking at and at the uh, previous example. Auroras around Jupiter in photography style with a telephoto lens. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you got a giant octopus. These don't look very realistic. These look like uh, they're made of a little art piece of a giant octopus made of jelly beans. Well, that's why it doesn't look real. It's an art piece made of jelly beans attacking a city skyline. So you can ask for all kinds of things, and you can specify uh, things that you want in uh, technical terms if you choose to do so. If you don't, it will go back to the default. Now, uh, these are the, if you go on to Mid Journey, you're going to pay, you get a free trial, but you're going to have to pay to get there. <clears throat> okay, this is not responding, but I think we've seen enough of it. So I'm going to, uh, I think I'm just going to end the screen share if I can do that. I think we've had enough for today of screen share. <clears throat> Maybe I should really use my other computer and give up on the big screen. This is just taking forever to exit screen share because this page is not loading and it's waiting for it to load or something. I'm back to screen here, which I didn't really want to be.